In the early 90s, Sylvester Stallone needed a hit, badly. When the decade opened, nothing Sly was doing seemed to be working. Rocky V was an unthinkable box office flop, and his ill-advised foray into comedy with Oscar and Stop and My Mom Will Shoot was a complete disaster. It was time for a back-to-basic Stallone vehicle, but even the Rambo series at this point was running out of steam. He needed a solid action movie that would allow him to stretch, but also remind audiences why they loved the larger-than-life icon at the same time. He would get all that and more in 1993's Cliffhanger. Enter Coralco Pictures. At the time, they were the masters of the high concept action film, having bankrolled the Rambo series as well as Total Recall and Terminator 2 Judgment Day for Arnold Schwarzenegger. As a kid, whenever I saw the Coralco logo hit the screen with the familiar Jerry Goldsmith music, I knew I was in for a total blast. They had planned to team Stallone with the late great John Candy in a comedy called Bartholomew vs. Neff, which was to have been written and directed by John Hughes. It never happened, and it's probably for the best, as Stallone's fans had been totally alienated at that point by his comedies. It's a bad humor, I know. At the end of the day, this might have worked briefly, for Schwarzenegger, but comedy was not happening for Stallone. He was then attached to two potentially huge films for Coralco, each of which got full screenplays. One was a movie about a futuristic train called Isobar, which would have had an all-star cast including Kim Basinger. The other was called Gale Force, which would have starred Stallone as a tortured ex-Navy SEAL who, after killing a kid in a drunk driving accident, returns to his hometown a hated man. However, when a hurricane looms and a team of mercenaries attack his small town, he becomes a hero, dispatching all of them in a plot that sounds an awful lot like what became the Hurricane Heist many years later. Neither movie happened, but the tortured hero aspect must have appealed to Stallone when he opted to make Cliffhanger, which was written by Michael Frentz, who would later write the James Bond movie Goldeneye. In Cliffhanger, his character Gabe Walker is a ranger who is dispatched to rescue two climbers, both of whom are his friends from the Colorado Rockies. One of them, Hal, is played by the great Michael Rooker, and he's supposed to be Gabe's best pal. The other, Sarah, is played by Michelle Joyner in a role that feels pretty low in the credit, making her chance of survival slim at best. Indeed, the rescue goes horribly awry with Sarah plummeting to her death. Reeling from the fact that he was unable to save her, Gabe quits the Rangers and leaves town, only to reemerge months later in the hope of reconnecting with his former girlfriend, a fellow Ranger named Jesse, who's played by Northern Exposure heartthrob Janine Turner. Why can't you just believe you did everything you could? Now, it just so happens that while he's trying to get his girl back, a team of mercenaries led by John Lithgow's scenery-chewing Quaylen execute a daring mid-air heist of $100 million in uncirculated U.S. Treasury bills via an air-to-air -air transfer. It all goes awry, leaving Quaylen and his mercenaries stranded, and the suitcases containing the money are gone. Gabe and his former buddy Hal are the unlucky rescuers, and Hal is taken hostage, with Gabe being forced to recover the money in order to save his friend. You, stay! You! Fetch! They strip him down to a t-shirt in order to keep him weak and placid, but what they don't anticipate is Jesse coming to his rescue, and soon Gabe is using his knowledge of the mountains and superior skills to take them down one by one. Indeed, Cliffhanger is a rip-roaring adventure. Stallone is at his best playing the vulnerable but heroic Gabe, who's aided by a top-shelf cast of character actors, including Janine Turner, who was really coming into her own at the time, and the great Michael Rooker. Plus, he's got the ace direction of Rennie Harlan, who was at his peak in this era, coming off of Die Hard 2, Die Harder. Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker. The action is ultra-creative here, with the guys making an interesting choice early on. In his previous action movie, Stallone always used guns to blow away the baddies, but Gabe isn't a cop or a soldier. He's an ordinary guy, albeit a strong one with amazing rescue and mountaineering skills. When he kills, he does so using the instruments he would know well, such as an ice axe or a flare gun. Most memorably, in a scene that almost earned the movie in NC-17, he impales Leon's baddie with a stalactite. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
This gives the film a different vibe, making it easy to distinguish amongst his other vehicles. In a lot of ways, Rennie Harlan is the film's MVP. If you look at Sly's other action movies, it's relatively rare to see him paired with such a high-profile director. While Harlan's career has suffered in recent years, in the 90s he was one of the top two or three action directors in town, and he gives the film an epic size and scope that the other guys Sly would work with throughout the rest of the decade weren't really able to achieve. It helps that the location photography is gorgeous, with the Italian Dolomites standing in for the Colorado Rockies. It was lensed by Alex Thompson, who would shoot Sly's Demolition Man the very same year, and it definitely wasn't cheap, with an estimated $70 million budget, which is pretty steep for 1993. Indeed, Coralco would extend itself on numerous films, with Harlan's next movie, Cutthroat Island, sending them into bankruptcy. They actually had to split the rights with TriStar Pictures on this one when the movie needed reshoots in order to cut a scene where a bunny rabbit died a grisly death, something that test audiences hated. Sly had to cough up the necessary $2 million himself, Notably, Stallone also said that the action was actually pared down in the final cut, as Harlan had overdone some of the stunts to make it seem like Stallone was almost superhuman, leaping hundreds of feet in the air. The film also has a very good score by Trevor Jones, who was kind of a specialist in the action genre at the time, and it gives it a different flavor than a harder edge composer such as Jerry Goldsmith would. <laughs> Plus, of course, you've got John Lithgow as the sneer-worthy villain, Kalen, with his fake British accent, and man, does he ever chew the scenery. You know what real love is, Crystal? No. Sacrifice. Now I'm the only one who can fly us out of here. It all added up to a bona fide hit for Sly, with the movie grossing a strong $84 million domestically, which was his best result in years. Now, if you consider the movie cost $70 million, and the fact that it only grossed $84 million, you would think that the profit margin would be non-existent. But here's the thing. Overseas, it was a juggernaut, with the final gross something like $255 million, meaning it earned a hefty profit. In the years since, it's gone on to become one of Stallone's most loved movies. But something else worth mentioning is the effect that it had on the movie trailer business. The early teaser was scored to Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries, and this style became de rigueur for years to come. Some years back, it was announced that Amy Lily Amapur, who did A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, and The Bad Batch would be doing a female-led reimagining of Cliffhanger with Jason Momoa attached to Cameo. But so far, the movie hasn't gotten made, and hopefully they never do, because you know what? Cliffhanger is great as a one-off and is one of Stallone's best ever movies. I give it a 9 out of 10. Of course, Stallone and Rennie Harlan would eventually re-team on Driven some years later, and yeah, unfortunately, it would not be quite the success that Cliffhanger was, and it's hard to see why. Stallone himself would kind of try to make a Cliffhanger-style movie with Daylight, which would kind of merge the disaster genres with the rescue genre, but the problem with that movie is it just didn't have a villain and was probably too far left afield from what an actual Stallone movie would be considered by his core audience. So, unfortunately, Cliffhanger would be his last real smash hit of the 90s. I want that money, and I want it now. Quail and the game's over. You lost. Of course, that's not to say that Demolition Man and The Specialist would be flops. Not at all. They'd actually be hits. But the next couple Stallone movies would not do well at the box office, including Judge Dredd and Assassins. <laughs> Of course, I'm going to get into that in future installments, but it would lead to kind of a lean time in Sly's career before he came back in a big way with Rocky Balboa. It has to be said, Cliffhanger definitely was the highest point he'd reach in the 90s, and I'll tell you something, 29 years later, it holds up mighty well. It's still a very, very watchable movie with great stunts, no CGI, it's an old-fashioned killer action flick that definitely needs to be checked out by anybody who loves Stallone. Remember, shithead! Keep your arms and legs in the vehicle! At all! 